You are listening to This Week in Cardiology from theheart.org on Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for May 21, 2021. This week, an announcement and a fast and furious review of ACC 21. First an announcement, I'm heading off for holiday for two weeks. This Week in Cardiology will return June 11th. Thank you for your support, and please remember, friends, take the time to give us a rating or a review because that helps others find this podcast. A brief comment on COVID. Nearly every day in my clinic, it's a cardiac clinic, mind you, people marvel at the vaccines. Our hospital is nearly empty of COVID cases. And Eric Topol tweeted yesterday that the U.S. case numbers and case positivity is as low as they've been in more than a year. Three weeks ago, we had 51,000 people at Churchill Downs here in Louisville for the Kentucky Derby, and we haven't seen any spike in cases. The front page of the Wall Street Journal Thursday had the European Union opening its borders, and HRS will have an in-person meeting in July. Even cases in India are going down in Globally, this isn't over, but it's getting close. Thank goodness. What a year it's been. Now to ACC. And I will break the normal structure of this podcast and offer briefer comments on many trials instead of an in-depth analysis of a few. First up is LAOS-3. The best study at ACC was clearly this Canadian-led LAOS-3 trial, and it was led by Dr. Richard Whitlock, a cardiac surgeon. Enrolled patients had atrial fib and were having cardiac surgery for some other reason. Nearly 2,400 patients were in two groups, surgical appendage closure or no closure. The primary endpoint was stroke and systemic embolism, and closure resulted in a statistically significant 2.2% absolute risk reduction in stroke. The Kaplan-Meier curves widened over time, and the add-on procedure required only an extra six minutes of pump time and there were no safety issues. Now, the most important thing to remember about this trial is that both groups, closure and no closure, remained on anticoagulation. LAOS-3 showed that concomitant appendage closure reduced stroke in addition, in addition to oral anticoagulation. LAOS-3 did not test the matter of coming off oral anticoagulation, and thus it doesn't at all inform the percutaneous left atrial appendage occlusion debate. Recall that in the Watchman versus Warfarin trials, ischemic strokes were higher in a device arm, and the only benefit, if any, from endocardial closure comes from removal of anticoagulation over time. Therefore, the positive results of LAOS-3 should not, should not enhance enthusiasm for device-based closure, which is limited by frequent leaks of foreign body left in the arterial circulation and the need for removal of anticoagulation to achieve any possibility of net benefit. I wrote a column on this, and Patrice Wendling has an excellent news coverage. Take a look at those pieces. Now, Watchman Registry. While LAOS-3 was one of the best studies of ACC, a featured clinical research paper on the one-year outcomes of Watchman from the NCDR registry is one of the most flawed. Remember the saying from surgeon Joseph Bavaria, science tells us what we can do, trials tell us what we should do, registries tell us what we are actually doing. The Mandrola edition would be if you try to extract anything more from a registry, then you are on shaky ground. And that, my friends, is what happened in this featured clinical research paper. A look at the baseline characteristics of this study reveals what happens when regulators are lax and enthusiasm is high. That is, indication creep. Consider that the CMS national coverage decision calls for watchman use in patients deemed unable to take long-term anticoagulation. 
but the average has bled score in this registry study was 3.0. Score of 3 would predict a modest rate of bleeding, 3.74 bleeds per 100 patient years. That is a risk level not usually considered high enough to warrant discontinuation of oral anticoagulation. But what is more, the rate of major bleeding in this registry was 69%, meaning that more than one in three patients who were implanted with a watchman had not had a major bleed. So I ask, why, again, are these patients unable to take oral anticoagulation? But the major issue with this paper, the authors present a one-year Kaplan-Meier rate of ischemic stroke of 1.53%, and they compare it to a rate of bleeding of an estimate based on historical controls of 6.2%, and then show this beautiful graph of a 77% risk reduction of stroke. In 2021, this is shocking. It's an embarrassment for our profession. Well, there's three obvious reasons why you cannot compare patients in a registry with quote-unquote historical controls. First, in a systematic review of papers looking at patients with AFib who do not receive oral anticoagulation, Quinn et al. in circulation has shown that untreated stroke rates have massive variation, even in the same Chads-Vas group. The translation is no one has any earthly idea what the rate of stroke is in untreated AF patients. Second reason, these were only one-year stroke rates, and the Watchman protocol calls for patients to stay on oral anticoagulation for a fixed period of time after the procedure. So one-year rates will be artificially low in the Watchman arm. Third, and this is the craziest part, at one year, 29% of patients in this study were lost to follow-up. They didn't have data on one in three patients. Now, how does this paper get into featured research? If this is published in a journal in this format, I'll probably go into ventricular tachycardia. Next topic is Sacubitril Valsartan. The Paradise MI is an industry-sponsored global trial comparing the angiotensin neprilysin inhibitor Sacubitril Valsartan to Ramipril in post-MI patients we have both an EF of less than 40% and clinical heart failure. Patients also had to have one of eight risk-enhancing features. Paradise MI was designed, therefore, to enroll high-risk patients, and if you believe the amazing risk reduction seen in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction that comes from the Paradigm HF trial, your prior would be to expect the Arnie drug to crush plain old Ramipril. But that's not what happened. In the primary endpoint of CV death and heart failure events, patients treated with the ARNI drug experienced 6.7 events per 100 patient years, compared with 7.4 events per 100 patient years for the ramipril treated patients. That 0.7 absolute difference translated to a hazard ratio of 0.90, 95% conference fills range from 0.78 to above 1, 1.04. The p-value of 0.17 was less than two standard deviations from the null, not even close to the accepted standard. Now, the authors, to my surprise, then used language and presentation techniques that seemed to distract our attention from the failure of this trial to meet its primary endpoint. We call this spin. First, they showed the Kaplan-Meier curves to the primary endpoint on a truncated y-axis, thereby accentuating the non-significant hazard ratio of 0.90. Always look at the y-axis. They then showed two other analyses, the primary endpoint with total events rather than time to first event, and also investigator adjudicated events. And then these, the ARNI drug looked positive. Now the presenter, Mark Pfeffer, said in his presentation that these non-primary endpoint analyses were hypothesis generating but then had this quote on his second bullet point on the conclusion slide. And as I read it, note the causal language for hypothesis generating associations. Quote, pre-specified observations of reductions in both the investigator reports of the primary composite, as well as in the total recurrent adjudicated events, support incremental clinical benefits of sacubitril valsartan. I wrote a column on this trial in it. I speculated that based on this miss in Paradise MI and a previous one in Paragon, the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction trial, 
Perhaps we are overestimating the benefits of Sacubitril Valsartan. Take a look at that column and let me know. Next up is the LIFE trial. Now, this was another trial presented at ACC using angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibition. This trial, which enrolled patients with class 4 heart failure due to low EF and compared Sacubitril Valsartan to Valsartan alone, and it found that the ARNI drug was not superior to Valsartan alone in reducing the primary endpoint of NT pro BNP levels. It did not improve the clinical out- composite number of days alive, out of hospital, or free of heart failure events. It did not decrease the risk of death from cardiovascular causes or heart failure hospitalizations. In fact, the hazard ratio for the ARNI was 1.32, and there was a small but statistically significant increase in non-life-threatening hyperkalemia in the sacubitril valsartan treatment arm. My friends, ACC brought little reassuring data on this expensive ARNI drug, Sacubitril Valsartan. Next up is renal denervation. Dr. Ajay Kurtain presented results of the Radiance Hypertension Trio sham controlled trial of ultrasound based renal denervation in patients with resistant hypertension. Lancet published the results in a simultaneous publication. The authors got all of the patients on a single pill with good doses of a calcium channel blocker, ARB, and thiazide, and this indeed was a sound methodologic move. Radiance Hypertension Trio screened 1,000 patients and enrolled 136. So right off the bat, this tells you these were highly selective patients and that true resistant hypertension is likely rarer than most of us think. Now, the sham controlled difference in blood pressure was a mere 4.5 millimeters of mercury, and this was only at two months. Two months. I wrote a column on renal denervation. It went up yesterday. I explained why, despite the enthusiasm from proponents, the results of this trial are actually quite disappointing. And it's weird. The current studies done in renal denervation have been much better about controlling confounding. The procedure has iterated to be better, but the trouble is now that we have better isolated the effect of renal denervation, it looks to be very modest reduction. As I so often argue on this podcast, we need a heck of a lot more data, especially on outcomes, not just a surrogate marker of systolic blood pressure, before accepting and embracing another expensive procedure. I hope you read my column and let me know what you think. Next trial is the host exam trial. Here is a super common scenario. Your patient has had a stent and has taken dual antiplatelet therapy for a six to 18 month period. Now you wanna switch to single therapy. Locally, at least at my place, most of us go to aspirin, but perhaps clopidogrel is better. South Korea trialists randomized about 5,500 of these types of patients to either clopidogrel or aspirin, and then they measured a primary endpoint of death, MI, stroke, ACS, or bleeding. And the winner was clear, clopidogrel. Over two-year follow-up, 5.7% of those in the clopidogrel arm had a primary endpoint versus 7.7% in the aspirin arm. The 2% absolute risk reduction translated to a hazard ratio of 0.73, and the confidence intervals ranged from as low as 0.59 to 0.90. Bleeding was 30% lower in the clopidogrel arm. MI stroke and even intracranial hemorrhage were lower in the clopidogrel arm. All-cause death was a bit higher in the clopidogrel arm, 1.9 versus 1.3%, but this was not significant and it was largely driven by non-cardiac death. One concern was whether evidence generated in Asian patients can be applied to non-Asian patients, but the thing is the Korean population has a high prevalence for clopidogrel loss of function allele, so this would in fact favor aspirin. And the fact that clopidogrel still won strengthens the case, I think, for clopidogrel. Five years ago, I would have been surprised by these results. But the more I study aspirin use in contemporary trials, the more I become unimpressed with its efficacy and safety. For instance, in 2018, we saw three non-significant trials for aspirin in primary prevention. And it's easy to forget that in Averroes, a pixaban versus aspirin 81 milligrams for patients with AFib, the bleeding rates for full dose of pixaban were essentially the same as with aspirin. 
And as was mentioned in Sue Hughes' news coverage, the 20-year-old Capri trial of clopidogrel versus aspirin 325 for secondary prevention found a modest but significant 0.5% reduction in hard endpoints. I really can't see how host exam doesn't cause consideration of change in practice when it comes to transitioning from dual antiplatelet to single antiplatelet therapy after stents. All right, next trials, alcohol and AFib. Dr. Greg Marcus and his team from the University of California, San Francisco, have been publishing some elegant studies surrounding the effects of alcohol in the atrium. At ACC, he presented results of a nifty experiment studying the acute effects of alcohol on AF episodes. They took patients who had known PAF and set them up with ECG monitors and actually alcohol sensors, and each patient acted as their own control. And they found that one drink increased the odds of having an AF episode by more than two, Two or more drinks increased the odds of AFib by more than three-fold, and the most likely duration after a drink for an AF episode to occur was actually delayed three to four hours. And there seemed to be a dose-response relationship between the concentration of alcohol and the risk of AFib. So for every 0.1% increase in the blood alcohol concentration in the previous 12 hours was associated with a 38% greater odds of an AF episode. I did an interview with Greg, and that is now up at the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. And the key take home from this experiment is that in patients who have AFib, alcohol seems to be a clear and modifiable risk factor for having an AFib episode. And I think it's an important paper to discuss with our patients. It's not published, but this will surely be published soon. This study adds to the mountain of prior evidence linking alcohol to AFib. Next topic is also AFib. This is the RAFT AF trial. Now, before I tell you about this Canadian led RCT that compared rhythm control with AF ablation versus rate control, which included AV junction ablation and CRT in patients with heart failure, I want to point out that one of the many critiques of Castle AF, now, Castle AF is the seminal RCT that found that. AF ablation was superior to antiarrhythmic drugs in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction was its design. Castle AF took heart failure patients who had either failed antiarrhythmic drugs, could not tolerate antiarrhythmic drugs, or did not want antiarrhythmic drugs, and randomized them to more antiarrhythmic drugs versus ablation. It's little wonder then that antiarrhythmic drugs underperformed. And to my young listeners, it's important to recognize that an important area of bias in trials comes during their design. Now, the RAFT AF trial changed the comparison to the strategy of primary AF ablation, e.g. get rid of the problem or reduce the problem, versus rate control, for example, control the worst manifestation of the AFib, the high ventricular rate. The investigators planned to enroll about 600 patients, 300 in each group, but alas, in 2018, the Data Safety Monitoring Board recommends stopping the government-funded trial due to low enrollment, lower event rates, and perceived futility. Instead of 300 patients in each arm, now there were about 200 in each arm. The top-line results of RAFT AF were that 32.5% of the rate control arm experienced the primary endpoint of death or heart failure event versus 23.4% of the ablation arm. The hazard ratio was 0.71, and the confidence intervals range from as low as 0.49 to 1.03, and the p-value was 0.066. The Kaplan-Meier curves, however, started separating at one year, and quality of life endpoints favored the AF ablation arm, though the trial was obviously unblinded. Now, I truly feel for the investigators and patients in this trial. I'm not a trialist, but I know enough to feel their pain. So the first bullet point of their conclusion is all we can really take from this trial is that the numeric reduction in deaths and heart failure events with the ablation-based strategy versus rate control did not meet our accepted threshold of significance. RAFT AF is inconclusive. We can say that the trial ended up being an underpowered trial. The effect size did seem to increase over time, and one can postulate that this is a type 2 error, which means that AF ablation is indeed better than rate control, and if there were more patients and more events, 
the trial would have showed that. In other words, a false negative. But that remains highly speculative. Now, what will surely happen, and I don't know if it's exactly right, is that the moment this trial is published, the results will be added to a meta-analysis of ablation versus meds and heart failure. This will again strengthen the case of ablation and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But again, this was a trial of AF ablation versus rate control, not AF ablation versus antiarrhythmic drugs. I've been in this field of ablation now for 20 plus years, and I think there is a role for both primary AF ablation and rate control in patients with heart failure. The key in choosing the right approach in these patients is exactly as David Sackett envisioned with his evidence-based medicine, and that is a combination of using the best evidence plus judgment and patient preferences. And until there's more data, judgment here reigns supreme. Next topic is the ACTION trial. Well established is that COVID-19 infection has been associated with thromboembolic complications. Early in the pandemic, there was much interest in using various anticoagulation regimens. And the top line results from a platform of three linked clinical trials were announced in January and said to show that a full therapeutic dose of heparin was superior to low prophylactic doses for the primary endpoint of need for ventilation or other organ supportive interventions at 21 days after randomization. Now, five months on, these trials remain unpublished. At ACC, Dr. Renato Lopez presented results of the ACTION trial comparing full-dose anticoagulation with rivaroxaban to standard prophylactic anticoagulation in patients hospitalized with COVID-19 who also had an elevated D-dimer. Now, importantly, ACTION measured outcomes at 30 days, not in the hospital. And after randomizing more than 600 patients, ACTION did not show a statistically significant reduction in a combined primary endpoint of death, duration of hospital stay, and duration of oxygen use. Bleeding rates were 3.6 times higher, and death rates were numerically higher with rivaroxaban. So ACTION delivers two messages. One is, don't use oral rivaroxaban in hospitalized COVID-19 patients who do not have an obvious VTE or PE. And the second, of course, is the power of the randomized controlled trial for answering clinical questions. Yes, patients with COVID-19 who have elevated D-dimers may have an increased risk for clotting complications, but this does not mean full-dose oral anticoagulation will provide benefit. Kudos to Dr. Lopez and the action trialist. Two more trials. Next is rehab heart failure. Now here is another common scenario. An older patient with frailty presents with acute decompensated heart failure. Everyone is focused on medical management and possibly even device management. None of the guidelines here address physical functioning. So a group of doctors have designed this innovative rehab program, things like helping patients with rising from a chair without hand support and balance, and endurance, and gait speed. This rehab program starts in hospital and transitions to the outpatient setting. A key goal of this intervention during the first three months, the outpatient phase, is to prepare the patient to transition to independent maintenance phase, which is in months four through six. The problem is that most such intervention trials have been neutral. So the trialist in the rehab heart failure trial needed to test this. Their primary endpoint was a battery of short physical performance measures. These have been used previously in other trials, they've shown reliability, and they seem to predict clinical outcomes. Rehab HF had clear and positive results. The patients in the active arm had significantly improved measures in physical functioning at three months. New England Journal published a study. Six minute walk time had increased, frailty scores decreased, the KCCQ improved and depression scores decreased in the active arm versus the control arm. Now, in the discussion section of the paper, the authors note that the magnitude of this effect was greater than previous trials, and the positive effects held up in most subgroups. A secondary endpoint of rehospitalization showed no difference, but I would emphasize that a trial like this was not powered for binary clinical outcomes. Instead, it was powered for continuous measures of physical function. That's different. And remember, cardiac endpoints aren't the only endpoints that matter to people with heart failure. Symptoms and physical function are hugely important as well. Now, there were caveats with this trial. They screened 27,000 patients to enroll less than 400. 
So obviously, these are highly selected patients. Also, patients could not be blinded, so there may have been performance bias. Another caveat, we've all got to learn more about what this actual intervention is. What did the therapist do, and how do we get this going at our own hospital? So I look forward to hearing more from the research team about how to select and implement this strategy. Steve Stiles has a comprehensive news write-up, and it's, it's as if he knew we would all have tons of questions about this extremely encouraging study. And a final caveat, we need to be very careful that for many patients, heart failure is an end-of-life condition, and for these patients, palliative care and hospice may be the best approach. I see a lot of patients sent for rehab to get stronger who have no chance of getting stronger because they are dying. Final topic today is the question of 81 versus 325 milligrams of aspirin. The ACC featured a large pragmatic trial of aspirin 81 versus 325 for secondary prevention of major adverse cardiac events. The main results of the adaptable trial were that there were no significant differences in MACE or bleeding outcomes with the two doses. There was good news and bad news about adaptable. First, the trial featured these novel methods in which researchers used a PCORI-Net group of 40 U.S. centers that are committed to compiling data in a common format. Invitations to enroll in the study were sent to eligible patients identified from these medical records. Consent, randomization, took place on the patient web portal. Participants in the trial then purchased aspirin at the assigned dose themselves. All follow-up was done virtually or on the phone. Outcomes were ascertained remotely from patient reports or the EHR and insurance claims without need for adjudication. So the good news is that this is a less expensive way to do trials. There were lessons learned that will guide the way to doing more pragmatic trials, which I think are hugely needed. Now, here's the bad news. About 15,000 patients were enrolled, and we still have no idea which dose is better. Why is that? Because about 85% of patients began the trial on the 81 milligram dose. So was there really equipoise here? Then, during the trial, 41% of those randomized to the 325 milligram dose switched to 81 milligrams, and only 7% switched the other way. Since switching was not likely at random, we cannot make definitive clinical conclusions about the best aspirin dose for secondary prevention. So that's it for this week in cardiology. I know I went longer than usual, but I wanted to discuss as many ACC stories as possible. I'll see you all again back on June 11th. And again, thank you for your support. I'm grateful. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org on Medscape.